All right, hey guys. So we have a very special guest on today's video. It's one of my clients, Nick. Uh, he runs a uh, hobbies brand, is it? Like Hearn's Hobbies, Hobbycraft. Uh, so like model planes and trains and things like that. And he, Nick has a pretty unique story, which is why I was super excited to get him on because the way he got into e-commerce is pretty unique. He didn't start his business, but he acquired it and then took it online. Uh, so I feel like his perspective is very, very different. And I hope you guys are going to enjoy. So Nick, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Fantastic. So, well, thank you for having me today, actually. That's that's a brilliant opportunity, really, uh, as I said before. Uh, very excited about this kind of format. Uh, something that um, uh, with my business recently, we start working on a lot more digital content, content creations and all that. And about two years ago, it was, uh, was a big push for us to, to start producing content, really. So, uh, but let's start back a bit about myself. Um, I have a very interest background. I ended up working in retail, but my background started into um, engineering. So my background is in mechanical and industrial engineering, where we just started in Italy. And uh, about 15 years ago or so, I was on a holiday and uh, in Australia and uh, effectively ended up staying and uh, uh, effectively transferring my life over in Australia, which is, which is great. Uh, so beautiful place, so many opportunities there, I guess, you know, um, you know, you, I could have probably not had in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So um, my first part of career was in uh, construction, you know, technical sales, construction equipment over in, uh, in Australia and in the Middle East. And then in about in 2014, um, I had this moment where I decided to change career and uh, went into purchasing a retail business, uh, thinking that I knew exactly what I was doing, but I guess, um, you don't know what you don't know. So at the time, you know, it was, was great. I thought it was a good idea. And uh, it took, you know, the first week to realize that uh, it was a lot more complex than, um, than originally expected. But I guess when you go into business, it's very often like that. Mm. Uh, you know, when I bought Hearns Hobbies, uh, and, you know, I, I knew that I was buying a, a, a brand, a business that was established in the market since 1947. So very, very, you know, uh, long heritage. And so, you know, at the time I was thinking, well, you know, for sure with a good brand, you can do something. And that's where it all started. Back then we only had three employees in a, in a small store. And today we have, you know, close to 20 and, uh, and two stores. And I guess lots of things have happened in between. Awesome. So, so you mentioned that you were in, um, sales obviously it's like such a drastic change right like change. What, can you describe what you do at Hearns now and like what made you um I guess commit to the move and also uh you, you mentioned that your expectations of what running a business was like versus reality was vastly different like what what did you expect and how was it in reality you know I guess um you know, in life, you always learn something new day in, day out, obviously. And in, in business, it's probably even, even, even more like that. You know, you think you know, and then the next minute you don't know kind of thing. So you talk to someone and you always learn something new. So um, I guess what made me doing this, this change was, I don't know, you know, I, I, I was working in, in this, um, you know, fast paced sales environment, traveling probably two weeks a month overseas. And for me, it was looking for something to stay, uh, to stay in Melbourne, really, where my family was. And I guess the retail business came very randomly, you know, um, it was an opportunity, you know, I saw the hobby shop for sale and why not, you know, everyone would want to work in a toy shop or hobby shop. So it was more like a, a, a childhood dream, you know, working in a, in a hobby shop must be fun and it is fun actually. Um, but obviously all the uh, background knowledge of, uh, working in retail and, uh, and, and growing a business, obviously is something that, um, you, you make as you go along, I guess the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge for me was, um, I guess from a, uh, product knowledge perspective, um, we have about three, 350,000 SKU on database. So as you go along, you have to learn the products purchasing, I guess, is a critical part of our business. So obviously going along this, you know, I thought, 
I have an idea what the hobby is, but you know, within a week I realized that there was a lot more to learn from a product knowledge perspective. And then also from, I guess, a retail perspective, retail, you know, traditional retail is, is, is very complex as, you know, what people do, how to generate attention uh, within the store, which is very interesting because it's quite, um, quite a challenge, you know, how, to, how you display your product in store uh, as a good correlation on how you build your, your web page. You're always trying to catch the attention of your customer in different, different circumstances. So um, there's quite a lot of learning really that happens as you go along always. For sure, for sure. So when you acquired Hunts, um, did you have any like experience acquiring other companies or working on deals? I don't know, maybe in the banking sector? Like, Not at all. Uh, wow, that's crazy. No, you know, it's funny somehow, uh, I guess, you know, when, you know, I'm very instinctive. So when I think something needs to happen, happens, you know, it's just that kind of speed um, that I really like to, you know, uh, I guess based on the way I operate is based on speed, you know, fast decisions mm -hmm. uh, over rather than thinking and overthinking and, and planning and over planning really. So, you know, for me, it was very simple. It was a brand, was established for a long time, uh, was in a very prominent location in a, in a major capital city. So I guess it was a no brainer. So it was just, uh, okay, let's do it really. Uh, at the time, I didn't know a lot about, you know, contracts and doing, you know, this kind of acquisitions. And I was very lucky that the previous owner was really kind and helpful. And we went through the process quite easily. And, you know, I learned about vendor finance, which is a, a really good thing that, you know, um, if you're buying a business, you have that opportunity. It works really well, rather than going through banks and things like that. Vendor finance to me was a sign that the vendor was confident they were selling a decent business. Obviously you wouldn't give vendor finance terms if you know you're selling a pool business mm -hmm. um and obviously it's 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 a lot easier you don't need you know the usual banking kind of uh kind of credit rating credit checks and and you know documentation and all that so a lot easier to do and for me ended up being really good and then mm -hmm. since then i used the, this kind of format with the vendor finance for a couple of other acquisition actually Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. I had yes, no idea you, you acquired other companies. So I'll 100% dig into that. Um, definitely. But my question actually to follow up was that was actually how to how you financed it. So you mentioned uh, vendor finance. That's actually a term I learned like maybe a week and a half ago where yes, correct me if I'm wrong. It's when you buy a company, but then instead of it's basically just like split payments over an X period of time, as you make profit yeah. with the company, you just pay it back. Right? That's exactly correct. Yeah. 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 So, so the way it works, I guess you, you know, you, you agree on a down payment, you know, deposit, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, uh, in my case, it was obviously more than half. I don't think you're going to get a vendor finance for, for much less than half the value of the business, but I guess, you know, you can agree to anything and then you have a payment plan effectively. So, you know, for, for us was, was set up in a, in a very convenient way. So every Christmas we did a, a large sum payment because I guess mm -hmm. this kind of businesses tend to be rather profitable over the Christmas period. And then throughout the year, you pay the interest. So every month we had a, a, an interest payment and then comes, you know, January after the you know, good income that you have at Christmas was a big, a big lump sum payment. And that took, I think about six years uh, to pay it off, which was, you know, for me really, really good. And, and then that being quite straightforward, you know, you built into your cash flow. Um, and yeah, it's definitely possible. Mm. And vendor finance would be a tax, it would be a write-off as well as an expense, right? So it should... Nope, unfortunately not. No, oh. you, you, the interest, oh. yeah, the interest are, but the actual oh, okay. principal you pay that, you know, um, you pay that after tax, obviously, which I guess, gotcha. yeah, well, gotcha. you know, I yeah, guess you yeah. either have them or make them, you know, there's two options, you know, so that's, sure. that's the way it works. So I guess for me was, um, you know, to, to get the down payment was remortgaging my my house. So remortgage the house, managed to pull out a few hundred thousand dollars and um, and that's it really. And then the rest was being a finance. I see. So um, I remember last week when we spoke, you said that the business weren't doing too well when you acquired it because retail was struggling. Um, yes. What was it like acquiring that business and trying to turn it around? Because did you did you was your vision of hey let's take this online this is going to blow up because of the brand or not at all you know 
I guess um, it was very much an impulse buy. I thought, well, this is super cool. I must have it. You know, that's kind of one of these things, you know, where, yeah. you know, you get your, your kind of, um, I think they call it uh, section 31 or something over here, which is like a statement from the vendor declaring what, what you're purchasing, the, the performance of the past three years and all that really. So you get all this documentation showing that, you know, it was, it was, you know, doing a turnover, but not much of a profit really. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, surely you're gonna, I'm gonna fix this somehow. You know, we, with such a brand, you, I knew that something could be done with it. You know, you could do anything. But at the time, um, I guess I wasn't really much investing into the online myself, and the business itself didn't even have a, a real software to run on it. It was running on a blue screen DOS type software. Oh. So we didn't have a website. The domain name was registered, but it was going on a on a landing page with a phone number. And so that was like ground zero. Yeah, I guess, you know, it, 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 you don't know what you don't know, right? So you start thinking, yeah, cool. Uh, we, we're gonna, you know, start looking at everything. And uh, definitely website wasn't all online or e-commerce wasn't one of the, one of the priorities. Um, and it didn't, we didn't have a website for the first two years, I don't think. We started with a website, I need to think, I think two years into the acquisition actually. And mm. uh, the first, you know, 12 months, so we're just restructuring, going through products and effectively installing a software that could connect to the internet, like a- Oh, like a, a database a, system. A, but. A database, yeah. So so we, we installed, I don't remember, we went through quite a few different soft packages actually to, to try to find a package that could handle such a large volume of product. So we yeah. went through, um, a, a really good little package that was called ERPLY was a, was a startup from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And that was really cool. Uh, so we ran with that for a little bit and we, we changed through a couple of different packages uh, to just try to find something that could handle this volume of products mm -hmm. and the speed of transactions. We're selling, we're moving in and out several thousand products every day. So Jesus. general, general, um, I guess, um, software for small businesses can handle this kind of databases. Uh, mm -hmm. Even some really well-known packages in in the you know worldwide available worldwide cannot handle sometimes more than forty-five thousand SKUs. They just they just fail really. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and so that was the biggest challenge really for a start to just start having a software that could communicate with an e-commerce platform. Mm -hmm. So before having an e-commerce platform, we went through the software process really, and then manually data entering everything. Jesus. So that was big, big, big challenge. But yeah, yeah, that's how it started. So back then we were three of us um, and yeah, I had to figure out, I guess the technology side of things. Yeah, yeah. Cause you don't really think about like the back end. So 350,000 SKUs and you only had yes. two stores or three at the time. Well, at the time it was only one store, uh, I think I don't even know how many SKU we had at the time. Well, I think it was probably more 150, uh, 150,000 wow. or so. Wow. Um, I guess seven, eight years later, we had a lot more uh, products. And uh, and so we actually built a software. So we actually developing in-house a software to manage the full backend. So we have a full stack software developer in-house and we develop our own uh, stock management, uh, point of sale, ERP effectively, mini ERP system that does everything that we need, including, you know, stock management for, um, for online sales, I guess. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That sounds like a challenge because the way you need to sort through those databases and search through is, is a headache. Cause it's like each individual SKU is a data structure that you need to. Yeah. Correct. Oh, crazy crazy it, it, it's 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 a real challenge mostly because you want to maintain speed you know so so you can get a gigantic database but then the indexing is becoming critical and 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 the updating so you don't want to have in that kind of situation where every time you look up something you wait you know seven seconds or 12 seconds so mm. everything needs to be within i guess a second or so so, yeah. so structuring the backbone of the database is the critical part so so i guess that's the thing that we worked on, uh, having ways to manage kind of a limited number of SKUs and all different tables that become active and inactive at different stage of each process. I guess, you know, having this many products 
and this many transactions, the volume of data that you are computing at any given time is huge. Mm. And so that's why we had to build it. Um, at the time, I look at the option of going with a software like Oracle or SAP. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with those, just be, you know, larger yeah. kind of scale packages, but it, it was super expensive. It was going to be like 300K or something, 200K. Jesus. So okay. yeah, that didn't work. So we decided to go solo. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Damn, that, that's cool. Because then it's basically like a retail turned SaaS turned e-commerce. That's crazy. Well, that's right. So I guess the next step for us is to try to sell this software that we built. Uh, I guess, you know, the, the focus is to run the business now. You have to sell it. But ideally, mm -hmm. I we have a package that it's it's ready to be sold. You know, we do multi-currency. We do, um, you know, multi-warehouse, internal transfer, stock equalization. Like we have some really crazy advanced tools to manage large inventories. I think Price supermarkets tiers, could be quite cool. Quite a cool yeah. audience, right? Supermarkets. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. So that's a lot to do going forward. Sure, sure. So then um, let's talk about the other business that you've kind of acquired and uh, like what industries yeah. are they in? What do they do? Same, same. So yeah, it was just to expand. So to expand, um, the first business we bought was um, was another shop that was uh, that wasn't doing too well in uh, in Western Australia, actually. So so we went to rescue this little business. Um, and the reason we went there is because these guys were exclusive distributor of a couple of brands. Uh, I guess I didn't mention this before, but one of the key aspects for uh, the growth that we had was to import as many products as we can directly into the country. So kind of uh, having unique products um, as fast as we could. And so from day one, we start sourcing products that other people couldn't find locally. Mm. And the acquisition that we did, I think it was about five years ago, roughly two years into uh, the purchase of Hearns Hobbies, then was to acquire two other brands uh, that we're doing really well with now. So these guys were distributors. So we went to, um, you know, buy that business. We actually had a, they had a retail shop as well. We kept it going for probably two years or so, and then we closed it and transfer everything back to Melbourne. But that was the first acquisition we did. And again, it was done on a vendor finance type base. And, uh, uh, and that was really quick. We actually paid that one off in more than three months or something. So that was, that was very effective. Yeah. That's dope, dude. That is dope. Yeah. So let's, let's talk like the numbers then. So what numbers was from a revenue standpoint was um, yeah. doing prior to acquisition and where is it at now? So, so I guess, you know, uh, when we started, we well, well below, I guess, should we talk AUD, Australian dollars? Yeah, or should we talk? It. Yeah, oh, okay, let's make it easy. It. So you, you convert to live. So I guess we were around, um, you know, just below the million dollar when we purchased it, you know, in 2014. Um, and today we are roughly, you know, five times that really. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, big growth. And in, in between, I guess, um, the second store, then we purchased another one actually. So we bought another store in Melbourne that was a pretty large business. That's pretty much mm -hmm. you know, double our current turnover at the time. That was three years ago. That was a pretty large acquisition. So it was, a, it was another store in Southeast Melbourne. And that was, um, yeah, kind of another impulse buy really. You know, this, uh, this uh, store was actually doing still reasonably well out there, but the owner was retired and uh, it was a perfect opportunity for us to kind of double the turnover instantaneously. And, and most of that at the time was for the purchasing power, just to make sure that we were like a, a key player in the, in the market. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those of you guys watching, cause I think like maybe 70% of my audience is from the U S it's a yes. uh, million AUD is around 700, around $30,000. And yeah. uh, five, a five million is around three point six seven million. Yeah. So yeah. definitely up there in the big boy leagues, um, especially when it comes to retail. Because I feel like once you're in the multi seven figures at retail yeah. with like two stores, that's like pretty pretty dope. Um, it, it becomes a very complex operation, and, and um, I guess you know the biggest change happened. I guess two two years ago where the digital marketing and the digital sales or the e-commerce became kind of a lot more relevant, you know? I mean, 
if you're a good established retail store for many years, you kind of didn't need to have a retail presence until, I guess, for me, it felt the need more, I guess, 2018 or so it became really evident that not having a good established mark, digital marketing strategy was a problem. So mm. that's where we started investing a lot more in, in that. And then is where the company structure changed a lot because you start mm. having different skills, um, different flows, quite a few, you know, um, things change actually. Yeah, for sure. Because I think that there's been like a big transition in terms of how people shop because I mean, even just three years ago, I was still going to the supermarkets and like buying stuff in brick and mortar stores. But now if you told me to go out and buy like a screwdriver, I genuinely, I was like, where the hell do I go to buy that? Like, That's right. <laughs> I just don't even know because I just Amazon everything. Um, yeah. It, it, it's, it's very interesting you say that because we, we recently activated a new channel, like an eBay channel. Um, mm -hmm. And I was very skeptical about the eBay as a channel. And it's actually been really successful. And I have to say that the customer we finding on eBay, they have a very different approach to purchasing again. Um, they just live in within the eBay, like you suggest, you live within the Amazon, there's a different category of customer living within the eBay kind of ecosystem. So all communication is very really fast through the eBay messages, but if you call them on the phone, they will never pick up. So it's a very, very different kind of um, niche again. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting, yeah. I think eBay is um, one of those places, if you go super niche, you can actually still make a lot of money because where, where eBay, I feel like is oversaturated, same with Amazon is like anything yeah. that's like home appliances that you can kind of just get basically drop ship from AliExpress or Alibaba and then just ship it in their warehouse. Um, but if you, if you have very like niche product knowledge about uh, so, something quite small, then I, I think agree. that's definitely a, a market to be definitely. had there. Definitely, I agree on that. So that kind of brings me on to like, what's been the best business move you've made in the past uh, year or so? And you can't say working Ooh. with me. Obviously, also that, well, actually that is one of the best ones to be honest. It's only been what, a few weeks now, but that's been really, really positive. We said that that's a very interesting question. Like the last two years have been very challenging, obviously. I mean, we, we are still in lockdown as, mm -hmm. as of today. Um, this is our last day of lockdown. Apparently we, we're going to go back to semi-normal tomorrow, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've been in and out lockdowns for a long period of time. So I guess, you know, uh, lots, lots of things that we did, you know, starting maybe two, two and a half years ago is digital marketing, digital content. So content creation in general, mm -hmm. it started really by producing a few basic videos uh, and then now is developing having you know a video day being released as we discussed last week you know and and quite lots of other things so digital marketing and being ready to have the ability of creating content even live streaming it was really really important during lockdown specifically because mm. um i guess it was a way for people to create a relationship with us while we can actually have the you know face-to-face -face type of sales relationship um also one of the reasons we started doing this is because the relationship with the customer changed a lot the customer tend to come in store to do a very simple transaction which is buying a product exchanging money and living as fast as it can people don't have time to talk anymore but we realized this customer is still looking for the information but they were looking for the information at different time of the day which could be at night you know before going to bed so that's where we transfer lots of our knowledge into YouTube videos or, or other form of content because there's a way to, to reach your customers, obviously, and inform them. But it's also a way to create the relationship because once you start speaking to them through a camera one, and then they come installed, they already know you somehow. So that relationship yeah. has started. So we start creating quite a few different you know, uh, formats of video. Originally was a pre-recorder daily um, we used to call it daily hearns or weekly hearns from memory. It was actually a weekly summary of us in store doing working. It was kind of meant to be fun, but that was creating meant to be. really good. Yeah, it was creating like, um, you know, uh, a, a, a relationship with, 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 with 
customers, you know, it, it mm. digital relationship, but it, it proved to be quite positive. So I think that was one of the best things we did, uh, doubling down in kind of content creation, really. For sure, for sure. I definitely agree because um, I think uh, YouTube, I, I get, I have mixed feelings about me doing YouTube because on the one hand, it's like it builds a great relationship because I was doing it from the beginning. So it was like you could see like a transformation basically. Yeah. But then it takes a lot of time. So right now I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm super grateful that I have like a, I work with a video editor that manages my channel. So I just need to record yeah. the content and that's it. But dude, yeah. when I first started, I would like shoot, I would script, shoot and uh, edit five videos and upload and schedule all on Saturday because yeah. Monday to Friday I was yeah. working on my agency. That, yeah, that was a that was a crazy time. So did you have a team right away or did you kind of oh, like that's an interesting story. So that. what happened is I had a person um, who was employed here and and she could do videos. So when we decided to do videos, she was doing them and uh, and that was great. So she had she she gave us a good start really but then at some point she left. She decided to change career and do something else. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I had to learn myself to do videos and edit. So, so for a good six months, um, I couldn't afford a videographer. So I ended up buying, you know, a Mac, Final Cut, cool equipment, cameras and all that, and start editing myself, really. So, so I learned a trade and I did a good six months of editing, shooting, editing, uh, and, 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 and all that. To then, I think it was actually a bit longer than six months. I think December, mm -hmm. was it December last year, we employed someone uh, part-time to do all that kind of work but mm. yeah I did quite a lot of editing myself somehow you know it's something you have to do yourself you know for a period of time specifically when you're growing paying off you know um, finances and all that really you 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 know you're trying to invest in R&D this is called almost R&D for me you know you kind of try and things you don't know whether they're gonna work out or you're trying to do a big growth so you're actually putting money onto different resources then all of a sudden you have to I guess, work at night to, to make it up, you know? Mm. So that's what, uh, what I did for a while. And, uh, and now we had the resources to actually, you know, do it, you know, have yeah. someone to do it. That's the, yeah. Look at your set. It looks great. Yeah, absolutely. The, the lighting you know, is it, super good. It's good. Yeah. It's actually, it's easier than you think sometimes, you know, you, you just, uh, you know, as you start doing it, it, it gets quite challenging and you start editing yourself. You're thinking, oh, this life is not good. So you kind of, realize that we, you know, $500 to buy a good set of lights, you know, and once you have the good equipment, it's really easy, a lot faster to edit. So mm. you don't have to do as much color correction. You don't have to do lots of things. So you quickly learn that buy a couple of good pieces of equipment yeah. and you're, uh, you're set. For sure. I, I, like lighting is, is super important because um, yeah. when I was first shooting content, it was in the house share that I was in yeah. the university. And then I would just put like my my uh, bed lamp on a shoebox <laughs> and some books. That's it. That was like my entire lighting set. I didn't know how to color correct and I didn't have time. So I just cut out the dead space and then just put it online. <laughs> you know, you know the funny thing you say, because I guess there's always this idea that the video needs to be perfect, but our mm. some of our most successful video were far from perfect. And our yeah. some of the really good ones that we thought were really good. They actually never done anything too good you know it, it's a perception of perfection and quality that is very subjective you know so sure. when we started i think we had a an osmo pocket uh from dji like a really tiny tiny gimbal like that and we used that one to do videos and it was fine you know it was a bit rough and and no ideal but that's where we started you just need to start with what you've got and then you know you do 20 30 videos with that and then you realize okay videos are going well so then you upgrade to a to different, to, to be more you know, professional or, or better quality equipment. And then slowly you build it up. You know, there's no point to go there and spend, you know, $5,000 in, in mega, mega equipment. Just start with something and just do it. You yeah, know, you can almost sure. improve. That's, that's my, the, you know, one of the strategy we use is just do something. And then if it works, you improve it. If it doesn't work, I guess you stop doing it, do something else. For sure, for sure. So, <clears throat> so following up to my last question about the best yes. business decision you've made, what was yes. like one that you would go back and change and just do different? I don't know. I, I, I guess 
you know, I, I don't normally believe on, on, on thinking backwards, you know, what you've done, you've done. Um, I don't know. I guess if you didn't do it, you wouldn't know you had to change it. Right. Because mm. I guess if you don't try, you don't know. So sure. I, I often don't tend to say, you know, somehow you, you've, you've done a project that didn't work out. Yeah, I guess you should have not done it, but if you didn't do it, you wouldn't be here actually talking about it. So I, I don't think we have things that we fail to think that probably hasn't, haven't produced as much. Mm. Um, uh, you know, so, sometime we tried to do things in house. We employed someone to do some, you know, some some marketing in house, and it didn't work too well. But I guess it was was an experience. We didn't have the tools to actually manage this this person or actually get the best out of us. So I guess, you know, that that's one of the things that would change is is perhaps structuring, I guess, the management of the company differently. Mm -hmm. um, we're just getting to the point now of putting a leadership team on board. So we started six, seven months ago to actually have a bit of restructuring to put in different level of management to manage all these projects. Because I guess something we haven't talked about is all the other things we do, we do product development as well in-house. So we, we design and develop products. So there's quite a few different levels of, of, of work. And I guess one of the mistakes that did when we start growing fast and branching into quite a few different kind of areas is to kind of structure the company. Uh, to have leadership team. So, so I guess that's probably one of the things that I should have done a lot faster when, mm -hmm. you know, things start changing specifically, I would say probably around 2018, when we start having a lot more digital marketing, and then we start going to having a web developer in house. And then we start doing, you know, um, design work for product development Then we went into 3d printing, uh, video, you know, digital marketing, we start having so many different skills within the group. Uh, that was really hard to manage because mm -hmm. I guess everyone works on a different time schedule, you know, based on what you do, if you're creative, if you are, you know, if it depends on what you need to do, you kind of have to be organized very differently. So I guess structuring the company earlier would have been better, mm -hmm. if anything. I think hiring is definitely like one of my biggest challenges as well. Like, cause I don't know if you had experienced this, but for me, I, I just think, Oh, like, I can't hold anyone to a super high standard because they're just like, they're being hired. So yep. <clears throat> when I hire people, I should actually just be demanding like, hey, you need to do this. If I instead I was like, oh, you know, just doing your own time because I get the stuff done. So I'm just like, yep. oh, I expect other people to do the same. Um, yep. but managing that is, is, uh, is, is a learning curve for sure. Absolutely. Well, I guess, you know, that's, that's a good point you bring up. So, so, so HR, HR is the biggest challenge, I guess it's probably for everyone, you know, um, I'm the same like you, you know, I tend to be like, okay, you know, I think we can work together, come and work tomorrow, you know, and, and then we go with the flow. But I would say when we grow over 10 staff member, 12 is where you really need to start being structured because otherwise it gets really, I don't know, kind of inefficient and, and, and uh, a bit confused. So, and I think this was the mistake, I guess, if anything, that I would try not to do again, um, is when you get over the 10 or 12, just just put some management in place. Basic management doesn't have to be really rigid, but some, you know, basic processes uh, of workflow of information. So I guess, you know, if you have 18 people referring back to you, you're going to mm. be spending all day, you know, kind of managing these 18 people. But if you have two or three reporting to you and the other say, 15 reporting to these two or three guys, then, then your life is a lot easier, really. So that, that is a challenge. Um, I guess when you hire people, in my view, you hire based on what you feel. I tend to go by, you know, gut feel. I think I can work with this person. You know, it fits within the environment, the group, accept the person. And then that's probably the best, you know, the best way you go about it. And then I, I know as sad as it is, you hire fast and fire faster, really, you know in a sense that if it doesn't work out, doesn't work out, you know, but you don't know unless you try. For sure. Again. For sure. One of the things I kind of learned from um, one of my friends is <clears throat> like, when you hire, you give them like a short contract. And then if they hit KPIs, then you can give them like a longer one, but never like just, Hey, come on board. <laughs> you know, there's always like a trial period. You know, it's it, yeah, the, there is always a trial period that I guess each country has their own different rules. Here in Australia, we have a six months probation, which is standard. So within the first six months, um, you can let this person go without real uh, any penalties. 
after oh. that, um, you can't do that anymore. Really, after that, it's, it's becoming, you know, you, you have to do a, what we call a redundancy, perhaps, you know, where you actually say, well, this position not available anymore or, or something like that. But, you know, I'm more of the, you know, opinion that, you know, you make a decision, you stand by it, and so you go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess you work with the consequences, but you need to give trust. You know, if you hire someone and say, well, let's try for two weeks, I guess no one is going to be committed. So oh, yeah, the, yeah, for sure. You know, the way I tend to do is say, okay, come on board. Let's assume that this is going to work out. And then if it doesn't, I guess, um, you know, it's something you need to realize pretty quick. You know, if, if after, you know, a month or two, you realize it doesn't work, then you're going to have to do something about it. But most times, I guess, if you, if you have the basic skills and the attitude, right, in the sense of someone wanting to learn and wanting to adapt and and, and to contribute to the business, I, I, mm -hmm. I think you'd be you're in a good place, really. Mm. Yeah, I think that's very smart. I'm still like learning a bunch about hiring and just managing teams. Um, at the you moment. will forever. You will forever, yeah, really. Yeah, you will get better, no you know. You will get no better. Doubt. And sometimes you get it wrong. You, you never sure. know, but sure. that's part of the game. What's um what's kind of been your biggest struggle then? Well, I guess I guess uh, HR really, if anything, you know, is is, is managing people. <laughs> um, and and it's it's difficult, I guess, because specifically when you're not really structured, that's what that these things tend to happen. You know, you you have issues with expectation of being set, and so what I expect is different from what you expect, and so then we don't align really. So. Uh, I guess that side of things really managing conflict uh, between different personalities that that will happen. Uh, you have teams where you know everyone has different kind of way of operating, and so you know tensions, and you need to always be ready to pick it up as soon as you can. So we, we we're getting a lot better at, at at identifying where someone is not happy, and it's a very simple situation where you feel someone is not one hundred percent. You just have a catch up. It normally takes three really ten minutes. Uh, you know, how are you feeling? And sometimes it can be as simple as, you know, something happening in a personal life. It's, well, how about you have the afternoon off? And off you go. But if you let it run for too long, then it can get, you know, a bit messy or, you know, you never know what's happening really. So I guess, you know, touching base with your team when you feel that something is not right or even, you know, in a routine kind of every every couple of months, that, that's really important. But HR, I think, is always a challenge. Mm. I see. Well, yes. we'll see when I grow to a team of 10 plus how, how that dynamic works, I guess. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Then other people are better than that. Then, you know, not everyone is, you know, some people are naturally talented at that, you know, and, and it just works. Some, some are probably less talented, I guess. For sure. For sure. So in terms of the business then, like what's next for you? Are you prepping to do an exit anytime soon or are you just trying to scale it? And if so, what's the target? That's a very good question. Lots of plans, you know, always have really, you know, like a large vision, you know, we have a software that we developed that I would like to sell one day, you know, not, not in a, you know, I guess if someone would come along tomorrow, I would be happy to discuss how to sell the software or to sell the you know, part of the development or whatsoever you know so so the plan is to grow always you know um so we have plans to develop this software and sell it the the biggest plan i guess is to carry on with our product development we started doing 3d printing for manufacturing so we're actually using printers to manufacture products on demand so we design products in-house and just uh print them and sell them uh as customer ordered them through the website so i guess that that's some of the developments that we're working on so I guess always pushing the the boundaries of, of what can be done with new technologies so carry on growing the e-commerce for us i guess is an intact you know market but we we haven't done it too well be until before covid started and so that's you know hence why we're talking you know been talking to you growing the e-commerce side of things that's a huge opportunity but i guess the biggest growth for us is to develop products mm, for sure for sure awesome dude well, yeah. hey, listen, Nick, thank you so much for jumping on. Um, I definitely learned a lot, so I hope people watching have awesome. also learned a lot. And um, I really appreciate it, and I, I really enjoyed working with you as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. It was great to chat to you. So thank you for your support. I guess the, the, the project that we did together was um, 
very important for me, and probably important for the future development of the company, learning and understanding some aspect of, of I guess, email marketing, you know, that we need to get us. So that will bring a lot of future opportunities for uh, for the business and, and I guess even for the two of us, I guess, and I hope. For sure, for sure. All right, guys, thank you for watching and uh, I'll see you in the next video.